Welcome back again. Uh, we have come to our last lecture and we are discussing interpersonal communication. Specifically, after discussing verbal communication, the use of language in lecture 7, we now turn to nonverbal communication in this final lecture. Nonverbal communication, sometimes also called body language, is not a single communication channel as language is. It comprises a number of different bodily signals that we use to communicate with others, including sounds, ways of talking, posture, appearance, head movements, facial expression, uh, and uh, a lot of other nonverbal communication signals. Nonverbal behavior, nonverbal communication includes the entire range of signals that we send as we interact with others. Everything except verbal communication. Oftentimes in social situations, what really matters is not so much what you say, but how you say it. Nonverbal communication can be even more important than words in communicating certain kinds of contents. Nonverbal communication plays a particularly important role in communicating subtle emotional attitudinal information to others. Michael Agar, the social psychologist, suggested that there are five basic functions of nonverbal communication. Expressing emotions, expressing interpersonal attitudes, to accompany speech and manage the cues of interaction between speakers and listeners, in other words, to manage the social situation. Nonverbal communication is also very important in self-presentation and trying to communicate our personality. And of course, many social rituals, such as greetings, are transacted non-verbally as well as sometimes verbally. Just to look at some more concrete examples, nonverbal cues serve many functions. For example, you can express I'm angry by narrowing your eyes, lowering your eyebrows and setting your mouth in a thin straight line. Or you can convey the attitude I like you with smiles and extended eye contact. And we can also communicate our personality traits, like being an extrovert, by using broad gestures and frequent changes in voice pitch and inflection. All of these nonverbal signals are very important, and when you do not have an opportunity to communicate nonverbally, you have a very impoverished interpersonal experience. The use of emoticons is a very poor substitute to actually using nonverbal signals. The significance of the nonverbal communication system lies in providing a rich, automatic, and highly efficient communication system. Part of the reason for this is that many nonverbal signals are sent and received automatically, as Darwin already demonstrated in his classic 1872 book, The Communication of Emotions in Man and Animals. The efficiency of nonverbal communication relies partly on the fact that our brains are pre-wired for sending and receiving certain messages. If you do not have access to face-to-face -face real communication, our communication experience is impoverished. For example, when you communicate on the telephone or on the internet, many of the important signals we rely on are missing. Even giving a lecture is much easier when you do it face-to-face -face in a lecture theater in front of an audience rather than do it to a computer. Uh, Elizabeth Dunn, a social psychologist at the University of British Columbia, also showed that having casual personal contact with other people is highly beneficial. In her studies, she asked students to find a particular building on the campus of the university and half of them had to hand in their mobile telephones so they could not rely on Google Maps. Uh, the people who did not have the telephone 
were slower in finding the building, but Elizabeth found that when they were asked how happy they were, the ones who had to ask for directions reported feeling significantly happier. In other words, the simple, short, casual encounter with a few people as you ask for directions actually improves the mood and the life experience of individuals. So as we have seen, nonverbal messages communicate about ourselves, our attitudes, our emotions, and manage the situation. And very often, nonverbal messages can be more important than our words that we use. Part of the reason why nonverbal communication is so effective is that many of our reactions are pre-wired. Neuroscientists have discovered that in our brains we have some neurons, so-called mirror neurons, uh, or mirror cells. These neurons specifically respond either when we perform an action, but also when we see another person performing the same action. In other words, observing a person doing something results in an immediate, direct neural experience. Mirror neurons have been shown to be involved, for example, feeling empathy. This is what happens when you see somebody crying. In a situation like that, even without thinking or elaborating the experience, we automatically respond with empathy and a similar feeling than the crying person. As I mentioned before, nonverbal communication signals are often more powerful than the actual words we use. There are many examples in everyday life where the tone of voice, the way we say something, is actually more important than the meaning of the words themselves. For example, communicating sarcasm is a good example when the nonverbal cues are more powerful than the verbal cues. Imagine or try, how would you say a sentence like, I'm so happy for you, in such a way that it sounds sarcastic. If you succeed, then the communication will have exactly the opposite from the meaning that's expressed in the words. A social psychologist, Mark Michael Argal, did a series of fascinating experiments where they asked communicators to enact either inferiority or superiority or friendliness hostility in the verbal and nonverbal channels. So in some situations, you say something friendly in an unfriendly way, or you say something inferior in a superior way. What they found was that when the message in the verbal modality conflicted with the message in the nonverbal modality, the nonverbal signal was about twice as powerful in determining reactions than the words themselves. In other words, when it comes to communicating interpersonal attitudes, the nonverbal dimension is much stronger than the verbal dimension. Because nonverbal communication is so spontaneous and automatic, oftentimes nonverbal cues can give us away. This is called nonverbal leakage, when a nonverbal signal reveals our internal states that we may not really want to communicate intentionally. A good example for this is the study by Tom Gilovich, which I mentioned in a previous lecture, on counterfactuals. In this experiment, Tom observed and analyzed the facial expressions of sportsmen, sportsmen and sportswomen, who got gold, silver and bronze medals in sports competitions. He observed that the gold and the bronze uh, winners showed significantly happier facial expressions than those in the silver condition. He argued that the reason for that is that their facial expressions reveal or leak their actual internal states, which can be explained in terms of counterfactuals. Instead of uh, simply rejoicing in their position, uh, people in the gold and the bronze positions are happy to have made the particular 
uh, status. People in the silver position, on the other hand, are in themselves disappointed because they missed out on the first position. That's the counterfactual that explains the nonverbal expression and its leakage. Now, next we are going to look at a number of specific nonverbal communication channels, and we are going to start with eye gaze or the function of the eyes in communication. Jean Paul Sartre, the French philosopher, uh, wrote that when your gaze meets another person, when you establish eye contact, it's an incredibly powerful and deeply affecting experience because when you look into the eyes of another person, it communicates to you that in that other person's universe, you are an object. It challenges our sense of being a unique individual. Eye contact is a very powerful signal and sometimes it reveals unintended reactions. Hess, a social psychologist, uh, describes the technique of pupillometry, measuring the size of a person's pupil in situations when the light intensity is constant. Hess argued that the increase and decrease in pupil size is indicative of spontaneous arousal, which observers can interpret as indicating reactions, liking or dislike to a particular uh, target. In Hess's experiments, he showed photos to men and women of different topics, as you can see in the table on the left-hand side, a baby, a mother and a baby, a nude male, a nude female, or a landscape, and he carefully measured the change in pupil size under constant light intensity. As you can see, men and women show very different reactions to these images. Women show a greater pupil dilation to a baby, a mother and a baby, and a nude male, and males show a greater pupil dilation to a nude female and a landscape. It's kind of interesting that uh, the reaction to pupil size is automatic but completely subconscious. Several studies found that if you show male subjects the image of a female and you manipulate one thing, that the size of the pupil in one of the images is larger than the size of the pupil in the other images. In the picture below, the image on the left-hand side has been retouched to show a larger pupil size. And you ask men to indicate which of the two pictures they prefer, there is a significant tendency to prefer the larger pupil image compared to the smaller pupil image. It's almost as if men had an inbuilt automatic reaction, preferring larger pupils which indicate greater arousal or potential liking. Eye contact has a large number of important functions in interpersonal communication. We use eye contact to monitor feedback, to secure the attention and interest of an audience, to regulate or control conversation, to signal the nature of the relationship and to compensate for increased physical distance. Eye contact basically is a signal that can be interpreted as either an intimacy sign or a challenge signal, eye contact produces arousal, but its interpretation depends on the particular situation and the relationship between the people involved. Eye contact, like many other nonverbal signals, is deeply evolutionary. Some research has found that it even works across species. Uh, if you go to the zoo and seek out eye contact with a gorilla and engage in uninterrupted eye contact, the observation was that the gorilla will often respond with rage, interpreting the eye contact as a challenge signal. Uh, the same principle has also been confirmed by Ellsworth and others in experiments where they manipulated eye contact 
staring at drivers at an intersection under some conditions and not staring at other conditions. As was found that drivers who received an eye contact, a stare, took off significantly faster after the light changed to green. In other words, they displayed a classical fight or flight response. In this instance, it was a flight, an increased speed in leaving the scene. Of course, eye contact, like many other communication signals, is also dependent on the cultural norms and habits of a particular society. Different cultures have different rules about eye contact. So South Asian countries often avoid direct eye contact because it's seen as aggressive and disrespectful. In Japanese or Chinese culture, apparently direct eye contact for more than a couple of seconds is also considered disrespectful, especially towards people seen as social superiors. Afro-Caribbean countries, uh, research has found that speakers look at the listener and the listeners typically look away rather than monitoring the speaker. Looking at the speaker may imply challenge and disrespect. This is different from Western cultures where it is polite to look at a speaker when you're listening. In normal conversational situations in most Western cultures, it is customary to engage in eye contact about 25 to 75% of the time, depending on such factors as the relationship between the speaker and the listener, the gender balance, and what kind of action or interaction you are participating in. Agal and Dean argued that there is a subtle equilibrium between the amount of time people spend looking at each other and other nonverbal signals of intimacy, such as, for example, distance. Uh, they argue that the intimacy of a particular encounter is maintained by participants carefully regulating the total amount of distance eye contact such that if there is a decline in distance, in other words, you stand closer to the other person, people will compensate for this increased intimacy by avoiding eye contact. This figure shows the results of an experiment by Argyle and Dean demonstrating the intimacy equilibrium model and how it operates. In this situation, the participant and the confederate of the experimenter engaged in a conversation and the confederate manipulated the distance between them so it was either two feet, six feet or ten feet, a rather long distance. The experimenters observed the amount of time that the participant would spend looking at the confederate. And as you can see, there is a straight linear relationship. The further away you stand, the more you look, and vice versa, the closer you stand, the more you reduce eye contact. This pattern obtained for all possible gender combinations, female subjects, female confederate, male subjects, male confederate, female subject, male confederate, or male subject, female confederate. Uh, in all of these combinations, Eye contact was used to regulate intimacy, to increase eye contact when the distance was large and to reduce eye contact when the distance was close. Now, this automatic intimacy equilibrium mechanism has some strange consequences in everyday life. Have you observed that when two people engaged in a conversation enter into a lift which is crowded, the conversation will typically stop? One possible reason for that is that if you're standing too close, you cannot engage in eye contact and it's difficult to sustain a conversation when eye contact is impossible. In other words, the constrained space interferes with the participant's ability to look at each other and without looking, it's difficult to continue a conversation.
Next, I'm going to say a few words about nonverbal communication by using facial expressions. I'm not going to be saying much about that because we did discuss this already in previous lectures. The point is that facial expressions are a powerful and cross-culturally recognized nonverbal communication signal, and they are particularly effective in communicating basic emotional states, as suggested by Charles Darwin and as demonstrated by Paul Ekman. Part of the reason for all human cultures using the same limited number of facial expressions is that there is a deep neural link between facial expression and emotional experience. Paul Ekman, in the video, you can click on the link and watch it, explains how this relationship between uh, facial expression and emotional experience works. Another important nonverbal communication channel is personal space, the way we use the space around us. Uh, space has many uses and functions. Hall argued that human beings have a kind of invisible understanding of different personal boundaries that surround our bodies. And Hall argued this can be divided into intimate, personal, social, and public spaces. The transition between these boundaries is marked by changes in behavior. For example, you feel comfortable looking at a person coming opposite you on the footpath until you get about eight feet away. At that point, people tend to avoid their gaze, indicating that a different spatial boundary has been entered. In other words, it's almost like we had an invisible bubble around us that defines our different spatial boundaries. Of course, these bubbles also show some cultural differences. In some cultures, people prefer to keep larger distances, and in other cultures, they feel more comfortable with closer interpersonal spacing. This chart illustrates the personal space dimensions that Hall identified. Intimate space is about 1.5 feet or 45 centimeters away. Only intimately known people will stand that close to each other. The personal space is the usual conversational distance from about 45 centimeters to 1.2 meters. This is how most conversations take place. The social space is 1.2 meters to 3.6 meters. That's what happens when a person is not actually engaged in a conversation, but they are part of your social space. And the public space is outside that. Uh, this is the space outside of which you no longer have a kind of personal connection with another person. As I mentioned before, the comfortable space that people experience changes from culture to culture. This figure shows how in different relationships, close relationships, personal acquaintance and stranger, people prefer to adopt different spaces in different countries, uh, in Romania, Saudi Arabia, China, and so on. These are cultural norms which different cultural environments find comfortable. If you stand closer than the appropriate spatial boundary, it will be experienced as uncomfortable. This figure shows the results of empirical research on cultural differences in spatial boundaries. The comfortable social distance space on the left column, personal distance with an acquaintance on the middle column, and intimate distance for a close person, and on the left-hand side, you see the different countries where these measures were taken. A special case of spatial behavior as a channel of nonverbal communication is territoriality. Many animals have rigidly defined territories that they will defend against others. Humans 
a less territorial than many other species, but we still claim territorial rights, which are often temporary. Territoriality means creating ownership over a defined space. It can apply to areas within your house, for example, your bedroom, or sometimes it might extend to feelings of territoriality about an entire country. Invasions of territory often evoke a deeply emotional response. For example, Iraq's invasion in Kuwait or Germany's invasion of Poland triggered very serious wars. Personal space is also uh, applic applicable to territories. A personal territory is the area we claim as our own territory, which others may not enter without our permission. If you go to a camping ground and observe the way people set up their tents and define the area that they temporarily claim as their residence, it's a very nice e illustration of how human territoriality works in real life. The way human beings use and communicate in space uh, can also be studied by looking at preferred spatial arrangements uh, for the purposes of different kinds of social interactions. Sommer studied how people chose to sit at a rectangular table depending on whether they were engaged in a conversation, a cooperative performance, co-acting or competing. And he found that there was significant difference as in the preferred seating positions, depending on which of these four different kinds of interactions were taking place. Uh, if you look at the chart on the left hand side, it will give you the most preferred uh, arrangements as a function of the different tasks. What this suggests is that somehow we have an implicit spatial arrangement that we prefer for a particular kind of social interaction. And if that spatial arrangement is not possible, we might feel less comfortable than we could have felt otherwise. Now, if we reduce territoriality and come extremely close to another person, we encounter another nonverbal communication dimension that is touching. Who can touch whom, when, how, and for how long is a very complicated matter, and there are strong cultural norms and customs that regulate touching or touchability. Jurad studied the availability of different parts of the body for touching by different partners, for example, mother, father, a same-sex friend, and an opposite-sex friend for males and females. If you look at the chart on the left-hand side, you can see the darker is an area colored, the more touchable a person is on that part of their body. So, for example, women can be touched on their arms and below knee by their mothers, but fathers can only touch them on their hands. And the same-sex friend can touch them on their lower arms, but the opposite-sex friend has a far more accessible touchability map. And the same for males. Uh, the likelihood of being able to touch differs depending on the partner. These are, of course, the norms for Western cultures. Different cultures might have different touchability maps, and some cultures might prohibit touching altogether in certain relationships. It turns out that casual touching, a superficial touching that you almost do not notice, does seem to have a very important and significant signaling function and consequences. A light touch produces arousal and can be interpreted as indicating liking and intimacy. Of course, there are again gender differences on how touch is interpreted. Here are a couple of experiments showing that casual touching can have 
measurable behavioral consequences. A study by Levov and Argo in Psych Science 2010 found that volunteers who had received a light pat on the shoulder from a female researcher while they were engaging in a task of financial risk taking were significantly more likely to be risky in their decisions. So the touch increased their risk taking and presumably their confidence. In another study by Heslin, uh, students in a library were slightly touched on the hand in some condition as they were picking up their borrowed books. Some students received a light touch and others did not. Heslin found that afterwards, when the students were approached by an experimenter and were asked about their attitudes towards the library, those students who received a light touch indicated a significantly more positive attitude, even though they could not remember being touched at all. The pattern of touching also tends to change as relationships change and develop. A study by Guerrero and Anderson in 1994 found that men and women have a different pattern of initiating touching their partners. Casual daters, you find that men initiate touching much more than women. Serious daters, people who have established a dating relationship, men still initiate touching more than women, but not by that much. Married couples, show the reverse pattern. Now women initiate touching much more than men. So it illustrates how the habitual ways of touching are culture dependent, they have a strong signaling function, and they also change with time in long-term relationships. Another important nonverbal communication signal is what's sometimes called paralinguistics the communication signal that is related to vocal information that is nonverbal. Paralinguistic means accompanying language, but not language. This include things like the speed, pitch, volume, rhythm, tonality of the way you speak, not the words themselves, but the kind of information you communicate by the way you speak. Klaus Scherer, who studied paralinguistics in great detail, uh, collated a table you see below uh, explaining how different kinds of vocal changes are interpreted and what they signal. So, for example, moderate amplitude indicates pleasantness, activity and happiness. Extreme amplitude variation indicates fear and so on. So we can study how vocal variations in speech can communicate our emotional states. We all know that when somebody is highly anxious, we can detect it from the way they speak. There is a kind of a resonance in their tone of voice, even though they do not uh, reveal their anxiety in the content of their speech. Another large group of nonverbal communication signals have to do with body movements, sometimes called kinesics, the movement communication. As is the case with the other nonverbal communication channels, body language or body movement also shows very strong cultural as well as sexual differences. Men and women move differently and use their bodies differently to communicate. Uh, body messages, bodily communication, kinesics indicates emotions. It can be used to express status, interest, engagement, superiority, and so on. There is a very complicated vocabulary of bodily movements that can be interpreted by people in different ways. I recommend that you look at this video on this slide, Body Language by Politicians. It's an analysis of how some well-known politicians use their body to communicate different social messages. When people engage in an interaction with another person, 
they often use their body language, the postural and bodily changes, to create a kind of coordinated focus for the social interaction. Shefflin, who is a psychiatrist, observed that in therapeutic encounters with clients, there is usually a very strongly coordinated pattern of postural changes and bodily movements. If the therapist uncrosses his leg and recrosses it in the other direction, then within a few seconds, the patient will do something similar. Shefflin argued that this kind of subtle coordinated movement pattern is almost like a kind of quasi-courtship. It's like the two interactants indicate to each other by coordinating their body movements that they have a single shared focus of attention. The figure you see below shows the analysis of how head movements by the uh, interactant and the patient seem to occur temporarily in coordinated patterns and the same is the case for body movements. If you take a video and mark when particular body movements occur, they, they occur not independently of each other but closely coordinated with your partner. Gestures are another very interesting and important nonverbal communication signal. Unlike many of the other nonverbal channels we considered, gestures have a single meaning, a semantic content. They're almost like words. They send a single message. Uh, sign language is when you systematize gestural communication to such an extent that it can replace language altogether. The kind of gestures people use are highly cultural and gender specific, as is the case with most other nonverbal signals. Uh, if you travel it to countries like Northern Europe or the United Kingdom, people typically do not gesture very much. The typical way of interacting is to be rather restrained and only use gestures in a very limited way. If you go to southern countries, for example, Italy, you'll observe that people use gestures all the time. To speak Italian means not just knowing the language itself, but you also have to know how to support your verbal communication with the appropriate lectures. There are many more gestures used by Italians than by Northern Europeans, and often the same gestures end up having very different meanings in different cultures. If you click at the video below, it's a brief illustration of how exactly the same gestures can have very different meanings in different environments. Even such basic expressions like nodding or shaking your head are not universal. Famously in Bulgaria, nodding your head indicates no, and shaking your head indicates yes. Uh, so gestures are deeply cultural, unlike many other nonverbal communication signals like facial expression, which have a much more deeply ingrained evolutionary basis. Now, as we have seen, nonverbal communication is a very complex multi-channel communication system. We simultaneously use a multiplicity of signals, facial expression, body gesture, vocal cues, uh, kinesics, uh, eye gaze, all of these things go on simultaneously in a together coordinated fashion. So far we spoke about each of these communication signals individually, one at a time, looking at what sort of meanings they might carry. In real life, however, all of these things happen together, simultaneously. So you might ask the question, what are the basic dimensions, communication dimensions, that these different nonverbal signals uh, indicate? Albert Merebrian, a social psychologist researching nonverbal communication, argued that we can basically summarize nonverbal communication in three dimensions communicating liking, uh, 
communicating status, high or low, and communicating the extent of control. Uh, Merebrian prepared a summary table that you see on the left hand side that tells you how these three different kinds of messages are communicated in multiple nonverbal communication channels. Uh, liking is communicated by what Merebrian called immediacy cues. For example, eye contact, body orientation, body forward, lean. Distance, closer distance indicates greater liking and touching. Status or relaxation cues, uh, which communicate status and social standing, are communicated by things like body sideways lean, arms crossed or not, torso relaxation or reclining, hand relaxation, and legs crossed or not. For example, a boss who is high status uh, typically indicates that by leaning back, perhaps putting his feet on the table, uh, and generally behaving in a way that indicates a high level of relaxation as a status cue. The third dimension is activity cues, which communicate responsiveness, engagement, how much are you involved in the interaction. Merebrian argued that the degree of gesticulation the frequency of leg and foot movements, head nods, facial activity and pleasantness, speech volume, speech rate and intonation can all communicate activity and engagement. If you put the three dimensions together, then you have a very complex multi-channel communication that creates an engagement in your partner and communicates simultaneously a great deal about your emotional states, your attitudes, your personality, and your relationship. These messages work together uh, as an important uh, method of interpersonal communication, in addition to verbal communication, which we looked at in the previous lecture. Right, well, as the cartoon shows, this concludes my lecture on nonverbal communication, and appropriately enough, you can express your reactions by using one of the nonverbal signals available in the cartoon. But please don't go away, because we are going to have a few minutes reviewing and summarizing the course and the topics that we discussed in these eight lectures. So once you registered your reaction, to the lecture. Continue with the next slide. So just to take you back to the beginning, when we started that course, I suggested that the purpose of studying social psychology is basically to satisfy our curiosity to understand the social world and also to learn habits of rational skepticism in questioning what we normally assume to be everyday knowledge. Uh, as I emphasize, social psychology is very relevant to understanding not only everyday social life and interpersonal behavior, but it also has lots of implications for dealing with social issues on the larger social scale. Fundamentally, it's about understanding human nature. What kind of creature are we? What sort of evolutionary heritage we bring to our current lives? Uh, one of the major points I was trying to make that our abilities and information processing capabilities have been fundamentally shaped by evolutionary pressures. We then said a few words about the nature of social psychology, definition, history, principles, and philosophical antecedents. And I particularly emphasize to you the danger of uh, not properly appreciating the importance of a scientific understanding, uh, which is under attack from various alternative movements, including postmodernism. We also looked at the issue of nature versus nurture, how much of our social behavior uh, is limited by our biological and evolutionary heritage. And as we have seen, 
Some aspects of behavior, for example violence, can be reduced effectively as human civilizations progress, but other aspects of social behavior, particularly ones that relate to mating behaviors, seem to be universal across all cultures and more difficult to control. And I also made the point that social psychology, the study of social, uh, human social behavior, can benefit greatly by paying attention to history. History is the record of how human beings went about solving the same kind of problems we are still trying to solve today in previous historical periods. In our discussion on the nature of human sociability, we made a point about the contrast between the double, dual evolutionary uh, requirements of group cooperation on the one hand and the relatively recent emergence of individualism as an alternative system of organizing life. Uh, that still represents a major challenge to us today because we, on the one hand, have a very strong inclination for tribal cognition, groupthink, uh, behaving in a group-directed way. And on the other hand, our current social system emphasizes individuality, independence and rationality. There is a couple of little links here uh, about controlling the group mind and also a comedy section from the life of Brian. This is a funny film which is essentially looking at how groups might go about trying to develop a unified view of reality to suit their purpose. The reason why humans are so likely to be influenced by group ideologies is partly that our information processing capabilities seem to be limited most of the time. Daniel Kahneman made the distinction between system one and system two thinking or thinking fast and thinking slow. The point being that most of the time we think fast. We rely on superficial second-hand information which we tend to accept uncritically. This is one of the reasons why throughout history humans, human groups uh, have been able to believe sometimes quite absurd uh, systems, consensual delusions as we have called it. This aspect of human gullibility of course does, does have some survival value also because by taking information from others uh, we can learn a great deal about the world without having to experience it personally. But it does make up us vulnerable. We looked briefly at the effects of status seeking and identity seeking on consumerism and some of the social implications of this human tendency. Uh, the search for dignity and identity, which normally we would have acquired in a small intimate group, continue to be important forces in driving historical development, as uh, the short uh, clip by Francis Fukuyama on identity politics will illustrate. Uh, we discussed social perception and cognition, uh, person perception, impression formation, and made the point that the way we see each other is not really an accurate representation of reality, but most often a highly constructive, elaborate mental exercise. We use categories, prototypes, and stereotypes to simplify the available social information, which serves the purpose of cognitive economy. And once again, Daniel Kahneman's System 1, System 2 thinking gives us some understanding as to how this functions. Uh, of course, categorizing and simplifying people has its problems and we need to be able to manage the tendency to categorize by counteracting it with more conscious behavior towards others. We also looked in detail at casual influences, attributions and self-attributions. Uh, the purpose of these uh, uh, cognitive attempts 
is essentially to increase our ability to predict and coordinate our social behaviors. If you can make an internal attribution to a person, that makes it more likely that we are able to correctly predict their behavior in the future. Uh, we have also seen how social psychologists like Kelly developed multidimensional models of how causal inferences are produced. And we looked at the many sources of distortions in the way we form attribution judgments. Some of them are cognitive due to the limited information processing capacity we have, and some of them are motivational designed to safeguard our self-esteem and to create a better impression about ourselves. The main point here is though that there are serious limits to our self-knowledge. We construct ourselves based on sometimes unreliable and distorted or biased information, suggesting that the very concept of self is in fundamental ways a vulnerable social construction. Finally, we looked at communication, verbal and nonverbal communication, and the general problems of how a communicative intention has to be encoded, uh, communicated in a particular channel, and then the receiver has to decode it, giving rise to multiple problems and vulnerabilities. We spent some time discussing human language as the medium of both culture external communication and thought, and the important function of language of capitalizing on shared already pre-existing knowledge or indexicality. Uh, an interesting topic is how language may influence thinking and various attempts throughout history to try to use language manipulations to achieve uh, changes in thinking. Again, here, there is a brief comedy skit from the life of Brian, an early attempt at language control. And in, uh, in this last lecture, we talked about nonverbal communication, which I will not need to summarize here since it's fairly recent. So in conclusion, uh, social perception and com communication are the essence of everyday social behavior. They are very important from an evolutionary and historical perspective, and they represent the essence of our attempts to cope with everyday social life. We touched on the idea of loneliness, shyness, and unpredictability being a challenge in everyday social communication. And I hope you go away with the impression that social psychology is an exciting, relevant, and interesting field to study. It gives you new knowledge about everyday experience. And I hope you will continue with an interest in social psychology and study it again next year in third year when I look forward to seeing you again. All the best and good luck with your continuing studies.